Good afternoon, everyone. We're pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour so useful and informative. We've developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize engineering challenges can be complex and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping details. First of all, I hope everyone is able to see this title slide on their computer. We have muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. We can go through questions at the end of the presentation. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done using the menu panel in the menu on your screen. Go to view and then select full screen. We estimate the main bulk of this presentation will take mm, about an hour and we will allow some time to address your questions at the end. And we do encourage questions during the presentation. You may submit a question via the Q&A feature or by enabling the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and typing your question to the host. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Michael Violette, CEO, Washington Laboratories. Mike is a professional engineer and is founder in, of Washington Laboratories. He has worked in compliance since 600 megahertz seemed like a high frequency and has authored numerous articles and publications for and about the industry. He has expanded WLL's operation to Asia and co-founded American Certification Body with operations in US, e, European Union and Asia, providing certification services to the global market. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand the presentation over to you, Mike. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that introduction. Also sure. appreciate that everybody's attending today. Um, I started out in EMC over 35 years ago and have been active ever since. So I need to bring up the other presentation now. Thank you. Well, we started in this business in 1989. Our first focus was on FCC, MIL standard 461, EU emissions and susceptibility requirements. We also uh, participate with various uh, organizations in the compliance industry. Our main service is electromagnetic measurements, product, product testing and certification for our United States and international uh, markets. Some of the industries that we serve include the IT industry, avionics, wireless, telecommunication products, Basically anything with uh, buttons, wires, and knobs is our customer basis. But our presentation today will be about uh, European requirements and the CE marking. The CE marking is a mark of conformity for uh, European directives. It was created, the whole scheme was created to create a single market in the European Union. Currently there are 27 countries and about 300 or so million, million persons that are represented in those countries. In addition, there's uh, uh, agreements within other the non-EU countries that allow the CE marking to be used for compliance uh, assurance. The real purpose of this whole scheme was to reduce what's called technical tra barriers to trade or TBTs by harmonizing conformity, assess harmonizing conformity assessment processes. This TBD, TBT term is a uh, World Trade Organization term that is used quite uh, widely around the world in order to increase market access and reduce regulatory requirements for products being shipped around the globe. So the CE marking process really broadly opened up the market access for global manufacturing. When we first started in the 80s, uh, it was pretty much impossible or very difficult for us to help clients put things on the European market. Uh, large corporations could do it, but smaller organizations and small, medium, mid-sized manufacturers did not have access to the European market. When the CE marking was enacted, this all changed. And because we have a uh, mutual recognition arrangement between the e US and the EU, this allowed our services and many other labs in the United States to perform testing to the European requirements, thus opening up 
big markets for our customers, and we serve that today. One of the big questions uh, <clears throat> involves what's going to happen to the UK under the Brexit scheme. Uh, nobody really knows, and it's a uh, hot topic of discussion. I will say that the uh, United States NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is sort of our liaison with the U US and between the US and Europeans uh, into the conformity assessment business, has, has created a uh, MRA with Britain in case something, the Brexit does not uh, um, go so smoothly. Anyway, this slide shows a few terms and def definitions. We'll be talking about European directives. The directives are legal documents adopted by the European Community Council of Min Ministers. By law, they must be adop adopted in each member nation, national law by each member state. Now these directives don't call out technical standards, but they refer to private standards making bodies to draw up these product standards. <clears throat> the, the directives typically have what's called essential requirements. And that fl what flows out of that is the various standards that are used to apply to a different, the different products. And these standards are called European norms or ENs. And these are harmonized standards and common standards for de determining conformity. These standards are typically developed by consensus committees. And a lot of them are based on existing international standards, such as the CISPR, IEC, and ETSI standards. Again, by law, they must all be adopted in the national standards by each EC member, member state. This is a type of harmonization is typically overseen by sen Senelec, which are the European Union standards organizations responsible for generating European norms. CE, by the way, does not stand for Chinese export, as has been joked before, but uh, Communa European, which is uh, French for European community. Another important term is a notified body. A notified body is an organization that has been quote, quote unquote notified to the other countries by a national authority, which means that they have certain uh, type of technical competence in the realm of which they're operating. Another term that is used uh, broadly between the US and the EU is called a conformity assessment body or CAB or CAB. Uh, these are equivalent to a notified body for example, uh, Washington Laboratories is a notified body and assigned number 1388. And that process was we had to demonstrate to NIST again that we were competent and we had the uh, ability to make certain types of opinions and issue certificates for different directives. This all is under the realm of the US EU mutual recognition arrangement that has been a, a very successful uh, in helping our clients access European markets. Now these are new approach directives uh, over overruled or overwritten the earlier directives that uh, were a little bit cumbersome and difficult to use. And the objective was to eliminate technical barriers, as I mentioned before, and create this common market. These new approaches call out essential requirements with the technical details left to the committees and the standards. So in the end, conformity to the European norms demonstrates compliance and the products that meeting those essential requirements are eligible for CE marking. Around the year of 2008, the Europeans uh, generated what's called the New Legislative Framework, or NLF. And the objective was to improve the internal market for goods and broaden the access. It also strengthened the conditions for placing a wide range of products on the market and clarified many of the uh, um, uh, technical details and administrative details necessary to prove compliance. In addition, one of the games was to improve market surveillance and the quality of conformity assessments. So it really upped the game in terms of uh, making sure that products on the market did conform with the requirements. And market sur surveillance is a pretty uh, critical issue these days. And typically what happens is each individual country in Europe has its own market surveillance program, some being more robust than others, honestly. But typically the, uh, each ma member country has the authority to take products off the market and test them, make sure that they comply with the regulations. The new legislative framework also clarified the use of the CE marking and creates what's called a toolbox of measures for use in product legislation thus strengthening the conformity assessment process. The following uh, directives were renewed under the new legislative framework. 
and you can see that these directors cover everything from toy safety to boats to uh, explosives to measuring equipment and of course uh, radio equipment low voltage equipment and emc and these three uh, critical directives are affect many many electronic products uh, and they the year 2014 was quite a watershed year when the EMC radio equipment and the low voltage directive were reissued with the uh, attendant numbers there. There was a transition period, but the transition period has, has since passed for all these directives and all products placed on the market from that transition place uh, uh, time forward must comply with the existing these directives. There's some other common directives that apply to electronic products. Uh, one is called the Restriction on Hazardous Substances Directive. Uh, the latest one, so-called ROS2, which was issued in 2011. And its objective is to reduce the uh, amount of heavy metals, basically, that are used in printed circuit boards and other electronic assemblies. And the objective here is to uh, limit the amount of leaching of these hazardous chemicals into um, groundwater when, once they're disposed of, or if they're disposed of in landfills. A related directive, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, or WE Directive, was reissued in 2012, and its aim is to improve the collection, treatment, and recycling of electronics at the end of life. Again, together with these things, these are trying to reduce the amount of electronic waste which is placed in landfill. One interesting objective that's occurring now, and I think everybody here can uh, identify this, is the uh, uh, striving to get a common mobile phone charger. You know, you have everything from the Apple format to USB-C to, to uh, um, uh, various other kind of plugs. And I know I have a drawer full of chargers, which are kind of useless. And so the, the drive is to create a common charger connector. So there's less of these kinds of things just being thrown away. With the issuance of the uh, new, legislati new legislative framework is some excellent guidance documents and guidance on the general CE marking is called the EU Blue Guide. And the link is here and uh, you can find this online pretty easily. And it's a very useful document that has questions about all EU directives. So it's a common, it's a common document that applies to these directives and implementation of those directives and compliance strategies. Specific to electronics is the red guide and the EMC directive guide and the links there are there below. And these uh, documents basically supplement the, the directive by explaining some of the applications and interpretations of the various directive um, uh, phrases and, and requirements. So our world is all about what's called conformity assessment. Conformity assessment means you're taking a product and assessing it to the requirements to which it applies. Uh, if you have a device that's going to Europe, you have to apply the various directives. Well, how do you perform that? Uh, the, that how do you prove compliance? Well, you go through a process where you may do a, a uh, uh, assessment of, and apply all relative harmonized standards published in what's called the official journal. So going back to these harmonized standards, the OJ or official journal is the listing of the uh, harmonized standards that may be applied to your device. If you comply with those harmonized standards, you can issue the CE marking without any further uh, further examination. The manufacturer prepares what's called technical documentation or TD that provides evidence of compliance. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. You must retain these uh, uh, these documents 10 years after the date of the last manufacturer of that device. You're obligated by and the market surveillance authorities can ask for that documentation if there's a question of compliance. After you go through that process, the manufacturer prepares a DOC or declaration of conformity. I'll have a little more details on that. And then the CE marking may be placed on the equipment. So the CE mark must be affixed to product packaging instructions for use or some kind of guarantee certificate. It's on many, many products now. You can find it just about on every device that is sold globally. Uh, it can be used with other marks, such as safety marks and other marks and warnings, as long as it is not, uh, <clears throat> doesn't reduce the visibility and legibility of the mark. So the flow chart here, or the uh, EMC directive, basically starts with the EMC assessment of the apparatus. What you would do is you go to the official journal and see if the harmonized standards apply. 
If you find the harmonized standards will apply, you simply can check the compliance issue, uh, typically go to a laboratory or you can do the laboratory assessment yourself. Uh, there's no specific requirements for laboratories. You issue a test report, assemble your tech technical documentation, which really doesn't go anywhere. You just have to hold on to it. Uh, you may have a EU type examination by a notified body at that point. That is always your option. Sometimes it's a requirement and I'll go through the right hand part of the chart here. So if you comply with all the harmonized standards, you do an assessment, you assemble the technical documentation, you issue a, a declaration of conformity and you're, and you're off, to, off to market. If your product does not conform with harmonized standards then you're obligated to go to a notified body which can assess the uh, whether you or not you've met those essential requirements. At that point, they would issue what's called a type examination certificate. And then you would keep this all this together. Again, it doesn't go anywhere else. It doesn't go to any regulatory authorities. And then you're able to issue a CE marking. Now there are, there is a database of uh, notified body opinions, or sorry, notified body type examination certificates uh, that is online and accessible to other notified bodies. It's not a public uh, website and it's basically there to lodge if there's ever been a uh, if there's a rejection of your technical documentation um, and, and a type examination certificate cannot be issued. At the end it, you issue if you get the type examination certificate you still issue the declaration of conformity it's the same form and fit and function whether or not you're using a notified body or not. Again, you keep all this with your technical documentation, you issue the CE marking and off you go. There are special uh, <clears throat> provisions for fixed in installations under the EMC directive. What I've been talking about mostly are products that could go to a laboratory and can be assessed in a typical way. However, fixed installations, which can range from anything from a power plant to a rail, um, to airport lighting systems, to industrial systems, uh, do require compliance with the directive, but there's no CE marking per se. Uh, the directive mandates that you have to do some kind of EMC assessment, which may include testing or may not include testing. If there are EMC problems, uh, the authorities may be um, request evidence of compliance, so you need to do some either analysis or measurements for your fixed installation. And if non-compliances are found, appropriate measures may be required to limit the interference. Compliance with the radio equipment directive is uh, similar to the EMC directive. Now what the radio equipment directive did is that it basically included all the requirements for EMC and the low voltage directive under its essential requirements which is under article 3. So you must uh, do an assessment of the health and safety aspects of your radio product. You need to do some EMC assessments and you may or may not go to a notified body. Again, similar to EMC directive, if there's no harmonized standard, you're obligated to go to a notified body in order to issue a type examination certificate. And the notified body would look at test reports, uh, your technical documentation, your user's manual, and critically what's pretty new in this uh, whole conformity assessment regime is your risk assessment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So if you fully applied all your harmonized standards, again, you're off to the races, you issue a de declaration of conformity and you're done. In our work at the Washington Labs, almost 90% of these uh, projects that we do, we are able to apply harmonized standards and the manufacturer can issue a declaration of conformity. Some cases there are no standards that exist for the device or uh, manufacturers may choose to use a different standard. And as long as the notified body agrees that you meet those essential requirements for the radio spectrum requirements, then you can issue a type examination certificate, the declaration, the CE marking. Now we also have a uh, interesting business in uh, China. We're pretty active over there and many of our clients there which are mobile phone manufacturers, wireless product manufacturers, access point manufacturers, apply harmonized standards, but they're interested in getting a notified body opinion because it gives them either a level of assurance to their customers that they've, they've had some official assessment done, or they use the, not, the notified body tech, type exam certificate to enter other countries. We often get emails from telecom regulatory authorities 
with an attachment of our type exam certificate and they ask, is this real? And we verify that the uh, document is real and the, that particular manufacturer can enter that country. So we've gotten inquiries from Sri Lanka, from the Philippines, from Vietnam, many other countries that may not have a, a, a firm or a mature regulatory system for evaluating products. So they rely on the CE marking off, or even FCC certification sometimes to enter that market. So the technical documentation I mentioned, it's a file of information kept by the manufacturer for their product. You must keep it 10 years, as I said before, and it applies to each unit on each new day. So it's essentially 10 years after the last unit is placed on the market. Uh, you need to show it to market surveillance if it's requested, and you would supply it to a notified body if you're looking for a type exam certification. The technical documentation is composed of the following items. Identification of the product, obviously. Uh, general description, its operating modes, its purpose, its, its use. Uh, conceptual design and manufacturing drawings. If harmonized standards have been applied or not. If they haven't been applied, you have to, in part or, or uh, not completely applied, <clears throat> you need to have a description of the steps taken to meet the essential requirements. So, for example, you have a new technology that uh, perhaps the standards haven't kept up with. Well, you may choose to use uh, similar types of testing, for example, uh, or assessments, and uh, you would have to make the argument that you're complying with the essential requirements by using that uh, adopted standard or non-harmonized standard. So, ultimately, uh, testing is involved. So, in general, why do we perform EMC or radio tests? Well, uh, during development, make sure it works. Make sure it will pass the tests at production for regulatory approval. So here at the lab, we uh, are usually have uh, very mature prototypes um, that may be ready for release or final release. So typically that's when we do the measurements on a device, something that's ready for release. Uh, often is the case, however, uh, products may not meet the requirements, so uh, they have to either do some design changes or modifications to the product. If that occurs, we need to make note of that and keep that as on record in the test report. You'd also do testing if there's any changes made to the product. Many times we get questions, hey, I have made this change, what should I do? Well, you have to look at what parameters might be affected. Is the RF uh, output effective? Is uh, the electrical leakage potentially effective? Have you changed the power circuit? Or what, what kinds of uh, compromises might be to the product compliance. And then you may do some gap testing to make sure that uh, something that the device still complies. You also may need to test do testing if any, there are any changes to the requirements. So many times there are uh, new technologies coming out there, new standards get applied, and a, a new standard may be applicable that wasn't applicable before. And this is truly in the case of the radio equipment directive, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You may also do uh, testing, production line testing. They may not. Um, we have some of our clients do regular spot checks. Uh, some people, some of the clients release a product and it doesn't go through any design changes so they don't have to do any more testing. So for EMC and radio testing, we're making measurements of the device. Typically, talking about noise, which is emanations from the device that may cause interference to other products, other services. Uh, immunity, this is a measure of the product's capability to withstand its environment. It can include radio frequency environment, uh, a lightning surge environment, um, other users in the spectrum. Um, and we also have may do transmitter and receiver performance or radio spectrum um, um, measurements. And what's interesting in the radio equipment directive that uh, was not in the pr previous RTTE directive is receiver performance. And the aim of the radio equipment directive spectrum requirements is I would call it spectrum efficiency or spectrum use. And so we wanna, because of the proliferation of wireless devices, there's radio spectrum is more and more crowded. The frequencies are, that are being allocated for more services is expanding. 
And so it's really paramount to make sure that the product stays in its intended band and doesn't cause interference in other bands. The wrinkle on the radio equipment directive is that it put requirements for receivers. Previous there, there was no requirements except maybe spurious emissions uh, from a receiver. Now there's uh, co-channel interference and blocking receiver desensitization uh, tests that make sure that the receiver is of a high quality. And this again is about spectrum efficiency and keeping interference down. Uh, safety testing is required and typically you're assessing hazards that are either electrical, mechanical, chem chemical, or thermal. And under the European safety requirements, again, it's a new approach directive, a so-called self-certification, although well, that's kind of a mis misnomer. And the evidence of conformity to all the essential requirements. These uh, requirements, uh, again, are intended for market inspectors, and we need to have documentation to support the use of the CE marking. In the end, the manufacturer does affix the CE mark, and even in the electrical, in the safety realm, there may be a notified body required for some products. This might be essentially very hazardous products. An example might be a, a chainsaw that could certainly harm somebody. And a notified body opinion or assessment is typically required for those uh, potentially hazardous uh, products. So the low voltage directive, uh, again, recast in 2014 and now in force. It's been around since about 1973. And it's in products intended for the connection to main voltage up to 1,000 volts AC, above 50 and up to 1,000 volts AC. And generally employed for household products, uh, information technology, office, laboratory equipment, uh, communications gear. It's uh, applied quite broadly to low voltage products. And it's for products where hazards are primarily electrical and na in, in nature. So once you've gone through your uh, testing regimen, your assessment regimen, uh, you're OK. You're going to issue a declaration of conformity. So this is your manufacturer's document. It's a piece of paper. It usually fits on one page. It's got to be included with your shipment and typically included with the manual. Uh, it would have the apparatus name and product name. Uh, interesting, the uh, name and address of the manufacturer or as authorized representative. So you must have an authorized representative in the, in the European Union. And this has a uh, recent parallel in the United States where the FCC went to a supplier's declaration of conformity or SDOC for uh, benign electromagnetic uh, devices such as computers and peripherals and non-radio products. So under the SDOC procedures, uh, you, a manufacturer can test at any laboratory, it doesn't have to be accredited, which is an interesting twist from the past, uh, DOC, DOC, procedure. And what the SDOC did is it combined verification and the declaration of conformity for devices under Part 15 and Part 18. The additional requirement that was employed was that the uh, manufacturer must have an authorized representative in the United States. And this authorized representative would be the point of contact in case there was an interference issue or question. One of the uh, statements, back to Europe, uh, one of the statements was the uh, following phrase must be on the a form of the following phrase must be on the DOC. The EU declaration of conformity is issued under the sole responsibility of the manufacturer. On the DOC is the identification of the apparatus so it can be traced. This could include a picture. I typically don't see that, but it could include a, a color image. Uh, the statement that the object is in conformity. It references the relevant harmonized standards and may have, if applicable, the notified body and the type examination number. So I, we tip, typically issue the type examination number, a, a unique number out of our system, and this would appear on the uh, Declaration of Conformity. There may be additional information. There's a signature, there's a person's name on it, and you would have the uh, place and date of issue. So when you're doing conformance, what do you have to think about? Well, you got to think about those directives. You have to think if you're going to use harmonized standards, if you can, that's the easiest route. And there are a lot of standards. The uh, three links here show the uh, links to the harmonized standards that have been adopted by the European Union for EMC, low voltage, and the radio directive. And part of this new legislative framework that I mentioned before is to harmonize the evaluation of devices. And what has uh, crept into these requirements of 
slowly, but now is fully, fully em, em, employed is what's called a risk assessment. So the risk assessment is required for several of these directives. And what does that mean? Well, you have to look at your device, how it's intended to be used, how it could be used, and what kind of risks you might have that would otherwise compromise your compliance with the essential requirements. It could be a safety risk. It could be a risk uh, that perhaps um, some unwanted emissions might appear in band and in other bands, uh, spurious emissions. It's uh, a little bit tricky, frankly, but there are guidances on how to perform this risk assessment. So you really need to understand how your product is used in its intended use, or unintended use. Because radio products are all over the place, we're more and more a wireless uh, society. I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the radio equipment directive. Here at Washington Laboratories, uh, about half of our products have some kind of radio function anymore. And we have to evaluate the uh, um, under the radio equipment directive. So there are big changes from the earlier radio and telecommunications um, type of um, uh, RTTE directive and its approaches to compliance. So products placed in the EU, if they're radios, have to follow directive 2014-53 and this superseded the older one. And what it did when it came into force is it includes the application of the EMC directive and the application of the load voltage directive. So there are three essential requirements, health safety, EMC, and radio spectrum. So you have, if you issue a declaration to the radio equipment directive, you would not issue a declaration to the EMC or low voltage directive because they're, they're incorporated by reference. So what if you don't have harmonized standards? We mentioned this before, notified body. Independent body, you can examine the technical file in cases where they have not fully applied radio standard. And the outcome of this is a examination cert certificate. And these uh, notified bodies are typically uh, 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 companies. They're not uh, government regulated. However, they are overseen by the government regulatory authorities because the, uh, the relevant authorities have notified them to the rest of the uh, commission or to the rest of the European community. So again, even if you are um, using a notified body to issue a type examination, you would issue a declaration of conformity. Now one wrinkle, one change in the red was that the notified body number used to be required if you used a notified body to issue what was previously called or was called the notified body opinion. Now you're not allowed to put the uh, number on the uh, CE marking. And what this has done uh, for many manufacturers it has allowed them to be a little bit more portable. So we've had the case where uh, we've had uh, customers that have a notified body number on their labels, on their CE marking labels, just historically or as precedent. So in order, if they have new devices, they would typically return to uh, the same notified body. What this uh, elimination of the number did is it allows a little bit more portability and a little bit more, more options for manufacturers because labeling is an issue for a lot of our, our clients um, because the, sometimes the size of the device is small or there's many other compliance marks that are required. So anything that can save a little bit of real estate on the label is appreciated. So under the declaration of conformity approach, you have to issue a DOC in any case, as I mentioned. It's dynamic and it applies to each new product which leaves the production line. This is a little bit different in the case of some certification regimens in the United States, um, because if there's a change in the product or the standard or the state of the art, the manufacturer has to make sure that the declaration of conformity is kept up to date, which means that the conformity uh, uh, assessment process may have to be re-examined. So you don't get grandfathered, so to speak. If the requirements change, you must adopt the changes right away. So if you have a product on the market already, however, it has, has already been placed in the customer's hands or on the shelf, you do not need to reevaluate, recall it. However, new units of existing models need to keep up with the conformity assessment requirements before they're placed on the market. So there's no such thing as CE certification. The CE marking process and the DOC process is a self-declaration. There's no certification. 
It's always DOC. Even when a notified body issues a type examination certificate, although there's a certificate, the device is not certified. This is uh, different from the United States and Canadian regimens, for example, where you would go to a, a TCB or a telecommunication certification body and you would get a certificate for that device, a grant in this case uh, for the US, but that device is a certification process, is a more formal process where for radio devices in the US and Canada, you're obligated to go to a, a TCB to get that certification. So if you're a manufacturer outside the EU, which I, I gather several of you here on the call might be, uh, the importer must take the legal responsibility for the product. So you must name this authorized representative on the declaration, but the importer takes obligation to make sure that it continues to comply. Um, the manufacturer is also responsible and the distributor is also responsible. There's a term called economic operator and it's in the directives now that basically name everybody up the supply chain all the way back to the manufacturer as being uh, um, responsible for continued compliance of the device. So the red uh, radio equipment directive scope applies to all radio equipment used for radio communication or radio determination, which is a fancy name for uh, radars, anything that uses radio waves to sense or to uh, image devices or communicate. So this applies to transmitters, receivers, and transceivers. Does not apply to wired telecommunications equipment, such as facsimiles, um, telephones, that kind of thing, um, unless it also includes a radio. So the radio equipment directive is a high level directive once you put something in there that transmits or receives a signal, it becomes a radio piece of radio equipment. And up to uh, 3000 gigahertz or three terahertz. And um, we're starting to see uh, devices that are creeping certainly into the, the dozens of, of gigahertz up to 100 gigahertz. And we recently did some work on something that uh, used 276 gigahertz as an imaging uh, source for, for imaging through paper and envelopes to see if there's any hazardous or uh, um, uh, de deadly uh, agents that may be passed through the mail. So it's quite a fascinating use of some high frequencies. We're seeing more and more action in the millimeter wave. And this is being driven a lot by uh, 5G. So a lot of the 5G uh, um, uh, spectra is up in the uh, tens of gigahertz. At any rate, the red assessment covers, as I mentioned before, safety, EMC performance, and radio performance, including receiver, uh, receiver performance. So other directives may apply. Uh, the red applies to anything with a radio. <clears throat> and the EMC and LVD do not apply because it's already incorporated into the RED. Other directives may apply, however. You may have to comply with, a, if you have a medical device, with a medical device directive, or if you have a machine, uh, you have to comply with the machinery directive. And of course, all devices must comply with the restriction on hazardous su substances. In the end, once you do all this evaluation, depending on your product and its directives, your, de your declaration of conformity would state compliance to all the applicable directives. Now, and under the market surveillance regimen, uh, the surveillance approach is coordinated by so-called the ADCO uh, in Europe. However, market surveillance is by each member state. Some countries, as I mentioned before, are a little more proactive. Some are just driven by complaints. If they find a non administrative non-compliance, they can always make the manufacturer pay for retesting. In the end, all EU surveillance groups are sharing information. So a lot of this has uh, really gotten a lot of um, more energy behind it because uh, the competitive nature of, of the products and this the wide variety of devices that are placed on the market every day. And it's not um, limited to Europe. There's a pretty robust market surveillance process in Japan, I'm aware of. Uh, in the United States under the TCB program, TCBs are obligated to sample test 5% of the devices that they certify. So it's a post-market surveillance activity uh, that is required by the Federal Communications Commission. And the TCBs are obligated to report non-compliances to the uh, commission and also are obligated to submit a yearly report on the devices that they have um, sampled and tested. So we're, we're pretty busy with that sometimes. <clears throat> 
So if you're operating a radio device, um, there are EU frequency bands. So the EU is not all one country. There are harmonized bands and there's a lot of them. And under the ERC report 25, the alloc allocation tables are there. So if you're looking to do some intended use in some part of the spectrum, the first thing you do is to go and research the spectrum and make sure that it's a harmonized band or if it's not a harmonized band that is used at least in one country. Under the radio equipment directive, one of the requirements is that the device must be able to operate at least in one country. Uh, the EFIS or European Frequency Information System is at that website right there. And this website allows you to type in certain frequency bands and what returns is where those bands are harmonized or where they're allowed. I've, I've used it on several occasions and it's not perfect, but it's a great starting point if you're putting a radio product on the market. Uh, a little bit more detail is in uh, European Recommendation 70-03, and it's a great guidance for what's called short range devices, which are typically low power things that are normally less than one watt. So if you're using a harmonized band, um, you can ship to any of the European Union countries. Um, are there other restrictions that you have to think about? Is indoor use only required? And certain ultra wideband devices and certain uh, devices in the five gigahertz band are, are required to be only be used in, indoors. Uh, is there a license required? Well, that's gonna be a country by country case. So restrictions of placing into service. So there's so-called class one and class two devices. If the harmonize, if the band is harmonized and you're putting it into use without any restrictions, the device is a class one device. If the band's not harmonized or there's some restriction, then it's a class two device. So this isn't doesn't really affect the testing at all, but it's important for manufacturers uh, to comply with the radio equipment directive. Anyway, so red compliance is pretty simple. So you do an assessment or test it, make sure it passes. You label a CE marking. You may need to use a notified body type examination. You always create a declaration of conformity when all aspects comply. Again, once you comply with all the directives, you must maintain that technical documentations and monitor the standards and the regulatory regimes to make sure that things don't change or you may, want, may not want to do that, but maybe you have a good relationship with your test laboratory or, or other associates in Europe that monitor this process. There is a conformity assessment um, uh, organization, Radio Equipment Directive Compliance Association, Red CA, and that's a great uh, source for information on changing regulations in the radio regime. And you can join up as a member. I don't recall the fees, but they're pretty nominal. Um, but it's uh, they've got an email reflector and other resources that uh, uh, keep, help keep up with the re regulations for you. In summary, uh, the directives carry all the legal weight and the standards have the technical detail. In the end, for the, under the European regimen, the manufacturer is always responsible for compliance and the labs may assist manufacturers, but uh, accreditation is not necessary. You can do your own assessment. And again, notified bodies may be used. So that concludes my uh, presentation. If uh, anybody has any questions, uh, Christina, we're happy to uh, try to answer them. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Yep, I've got a few of them here. Um, first question is, if I integrate several products with CE marks from different manufacturers and create a new product, is it considered valid to apply a CE mark based on those other CE marks? Well, they, we used to say CE plus CE does not equal CE, and that's still the case. So you have you have to do something. So what does that mean? Well, you might have to run some some emissions tests. You may have to uh, perform some immunity work. It, it really depends on the configuration. But in the end, you have to show that you comply with the essential requirements. So we all we we all often have this question. We have clients that come to us and. And uh, we may give them a range of full testing to partial testing. Uh, if you've got test results from uh, some other manufacturer, that may be considered. Uh, you could go to a notified body and get an opinion based on your, your technical documentation. So it really kind of depends on, on the situation and it, it, there's a, variables in there that have to be assessed. 
but uh, in the end, you have to do something. Okay. Um, this next question is in reference to the uh, other common directives you were speaking on. Uh, can you speak about the eco design directive? No. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it ties in with uh, Ro 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 Roth in some Ro way. I, I really am not I'm not sure about that. I guess is it an maybe it's an environmental directive. I'll uh, this says that, uh, I looked it up, it says, adopted in October of 08, the directive sets mandatory ecological requirements for energy using and energy-related products sold in the EU. So probably like refrigerators and yeah, things like that. Similar to Energy Star in the United States. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you, we uh, don't have any requests for that. And uh, perhaps we need to uh, do a little research and maybe we'll have a new service. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. Um, so the next question, can a new revision of a standard for an EU directive be used before it's harmonized, for example, published in the in the official journal? Sure. Uh, you have to go to a notified body, though, because if it's not harmonized, you're obligated to go to a notified body. Maybe perfectly used, um, perfect, perfectly okay. Okay. Um, let's see, the next question, uh, new approach EU directives require a manufacturer's address on each product shipped to the EU countries. Good. Has a ruling been made that the manufacturer's email address is sufficient? I haven't seen anything particular about the email address, um, but you, de you have to have the name and address. That is a, that is a definitely a new requirement that uh, I think is a little bit onerous, but um, you know, maybe a website or something like that might be more appropriate. Okay. And, um, oh, the the question that I had before about that eco design directive, uh, uh, they, the person was said that it's energy regulation for ITE products that they're looking for conversation about. Uh-huh. Yeah, I apologize. I, that's just not in my, uh, in my forte right now. I mean, we... We've variously done Energy Star type, you know, evaluations for the United States, uh, but there's really been no demand that I can recall for uh, for people going to Europe with this. Okay. Well, I guess our official position is to be continued. <laughs> yeah, to be determined. That's it. Probably. Okay, next question. When complying to reg, should you not use a CE number or do you not have to? So I believe this refers to a number, a notified body number. Um, if that's the case, then under a radio equipment directive, you're not allowed to put the notified body number on your CE marking, even if you've gotten a, uh, you know, a review and a, a type exam certificate from a notified body. Interesting, okay. I, um, so it looks like we've gone through m most of the questions. I guess we can wait a minute here. I'll, I'll re take this moment to remind everybody that uh, this presentation is, is being recorded and will be sent out to everyone after it ends. Um, but if, if we do conclude today and you don't get a chance to get your question answered, you can always contact us via email. Happy to take your questions. Uh, Christina, thank you for your excellent hosting job once again. And thanks to the attendees for attending our, our webinar. Have a great day, night, evening. Well, before we log off, guess what? We got two more <laughs> questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> How about that? So uh, the the red, it, that person says, can can that be superseded by another directive? If you put a if you put a radio in your device, you're obligated to comply with the red. You may have other directives that are, apply. For example, maybe you have a medical device, and we've done evaluations on uh, stent inflators that have a Bluetooth um, function. Um, so the device had to comply with the radio equipment directive, and it also had medical device directive requirements. So in any case, you put a radio on your device, it's a red product. 
All right. So uh, last question here. Can you explain the role of an economic operator? The way I understand it, it's basically anybody in the supply chain that uh, brings the uh, device to the user. So it could be a distributor, a manufacturer, certainly. Yeah. Um, it could be uh, anybody who has an influence on the product placement on the market. That's my understanding of an economic operator. So it's pretty broad. Sure. Okay, well, um, I am looking, let me check the Q&A here and see if there's any other ones that have come in. Looks like we have quite a few that have come into Q&A. Okay. So, well, hold on. Could you elaborate on the cases or examples where notified body is needed or not? What that, that flow chart, I guess, is the reference. In what case is there not a harmonized standard? And what is an example of a harmonized standard or non-harmonized standard? And how do you determine whether or not it's harmonized? Okay, so a harmonized standard, first it, it will start with EN, which means European norm. Okay, so first you start there and then you look at the rest of the number. And if it appears on the official journal of the European Union, then it's harmonized. If it's not in the official journal, it's not harmonized. So an example of a non-harmonized standard where we've done an evaluation is uh, under radio equipment directive. Um, there's a, it includes basically anything in the radio path. And so we've done a, a little bit of work with antenna manufacturers for, for automobiles. And there are no harmonized standards specifically for that application, that use. And so we're, we're allowed as a notified body to take a look at that and we would get information on what kind of compliance uh, the manufacturer may have done and that this could be performance or you know making sure it, it hits the right specifications and at that point we issue a type exam certificate for that for that product another example um, in general uh, over the past we've taken say military mill standard testing as a an example of presumption of conformity in that case you have to do some analysis say what testing has been done and perform a technical justification why the device meets the essential requirements it all boils it all kind of flows back up to the director where you have to comply with the essential requirements and if you use something that not not harmonized you're obligated to use a notified body okay um, let's see, can CE mark be E labeled? No, no, not yet. All right. It, it's, it's anticipated that it may come, but they haven't, uh, allowed the use of an E label yet. This is, uh, in kind of in contrast to FCC and Japan and others that allow E label and things that have, uh, um, displays, you know, like smartwatches and cell phones. Okay. Um, let's see. Does CE mark eliminate the need for the uh, Rojas mark? No. The Rojas mark is uh, under under the product directive for anything that's electronic. So you're obligated to comply with the Rojas. Okay. And then again about the ce mark is is the ce mark on packaging optional yes it must be on the product it could be on the packaging label but it must be on, it must be on the product right okay um let's see should we list both machinery directive and ivdd on the declaration of conformity if they both come if they both apply sure I guess it's the in vitro diagnostic uh, directive. If your device is a machine and it's IV um, in vitro device, then you have to have the both directives on your declaration. If you put a radio in it, you got to put the radio directive on there too. Okay. So the only the only thing Red did was uh, eliminate the need specifically to reference the EMC directive and low voltage directive because it's incorporated in the evaluation. 
Okay. Uh, looks like I've got one more question here. Uh, do you do consulting for more detailed questions? Sure. It's what gets up uh, us out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Just drop me a line. My email's there on the screen. Be happy to uh, help you in any way we can. Okay. Well. Um, oh, look. Here's another one. Will LBD and EMCD incorporate into IBDD? I believe that they're stand standalone. I, I honestly don't have any uh, experience with IBDD. I'd have to re research that. But if your device must comply with IBDD and it has uh, electromagnetic compatibility or electrical safety issues, then uh, you, would, uh, you would reference both the EMC and the LBD. But I Okay, so would the Rojas Directive also be required on a red declaration of conformity? Uh, you would you would put that on there, I believe, yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. I think I haven't seen any other questions flowing in. I do believe I've answered all of them. Good questions. I appreciate that. It's tough to clarify some, some things. Absolutely. Okay. So I think um, at this point we can go ahead and uh, wrap it up, Mike. So thanks very much for you taking your time out today to answer questions. It's my pleasure. Thanks for your hosting. Again, everybody have a, have a pleasant day. Okay. Thanks. And on behalf of Washington Labs Academy, I want to thank everyone for their attendance as well. I'm going to go ahead and end the event. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Until next time. Bye-bye.